name is Christine Gelly. I am the Agriculture and Natural Resources Extension Educator for Noble County. I am a member of the Ohio State Forages team, and today we want to introduce you to a program that's coming up. It is a collaborative effort between an assortment of agencies, and it will be on Saturday, June 16th. The program is called Discovering Warm Season Native Grasses, and that program will take place at a National Historical Park in Chillicothe, Ohio, and that is Hopewell Culture National Historical Park. Today on the show, we have two guests from the Park Service. We have with us Brett Ruby and Jason Snyder, and they're going to tell us some of the history of the park, how native warm season grasses play in, and uh, why we are inviting you out for that event. Share with us some of the history of the park, please. Great, thank you very much. Thanks for having us here. So yes, I'm Brett Ruby. I'm an archeologist and chief of cultural and natural resources at the park. And introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Jason Snyder and I'm a biological science technician here at Hopewell Culture. And thanks Christine for having us down. It's a great way to promote the event. We're very excited about it. So this event that's coming up, it's a collaborative effort between the National Park Service, OSU Extension, uh, the Research Center, OSU South Centers at Piketon. We also have representatives from the Division of Wildlife, the Ohio Forage and Grasslands Council, and Pheasants Forever and, Fail and Quail Forever. It's gonna be really exciting. We'll cover three main topics um, that include park history, wildlife conservation, and using warm, seed of na warm season natives for livestock production. So how, um, what is the history of the park? What is special about that park? Okay, so Hopewell Culture is a national park in Ross County, Ohio, and we preserve six monumental mound and earthwork complexes. These were places that were built by American Indians nearly 2,000 years ago, and they served as ceremonial centers in an American Indian religious movement that really swept across all of Eastern North America. And for about 400 years, Native American societies all across the eastern United States were linked together uh, from the Great Lakes to the Gulf Coast, from the Plains to the Appalachian Mountains. And these monumental earthwork sites in Ross County, Ohio, they were, uh, they were known far and wide. People all across that area would have known about these places uh, near what is Chillicothe today. And these earthworks are really unique and exceptional in all the world for their monumental size, their geometric precision, and their intricate astronomical alignments. I think we have a, part, uh, a map that shows the six sites in Ross County here. Yes, yeah, so these are the... These are sort of bird's eye view maps of the six park units. And you can see that uh, these earthworks are earthen enclosures. They're made of uh, earthen walls that some of them stood from maybe three to 12 feet tall. And some of these earthen walls ran for literally miles, enclosing more than 100 acres in some places. And in precise geometric forms of circles and squares and octagons. And some of these geometric enclosures were precisely aligned to celestial phenomena, to the movements of the sun and the moon along the horizon. Uh, so the, uh, many of them are aligned to the winter and the, sol and the summer solstices. And some of the earthworks are even aligned to a long lunar calendar that takes 18.6 years uh, to run that cycle. And uh, this is the Newark earthworks uh, uh, that shows one of those alignments. And the ceremonies that were conducted in these places, uh, some of these required sacred objects that were made, you know, ex exquisitely crafted objects made from raw materials drawn from all across Eastern North America. There's copper from the Great Lakes. There's marine shell from uh, the Gulf of Mexico. And these objects you're seeing here are smoking pipes, tobacco smoking pipes, uh, that were used ceremonially, and most of these are carved from 
pipestone, uh, some of which came from southern Ohio near Portsmouth, and but other of the, these pipes were carved from a stone um, from Illinois near Chicago. But you can see just the exquisite craftsmanship there, and also those, uh, you know, those pipes also sort of show the the linkage or the relationship between these people and their natural environment all around them. And I should point out that seven of these sites, five of the earthworks within Hopewell Culture National Historical Park, and two others, earthworks at Newark and earthworks at Fort Ancient, those two sites are managed by the Ohio History Connection. Uh, but all those sites together are under consideration now for nomination to the World Heritage List, which is the world's most prestigious list of the, you know, the most out outstanding natural and cultural places in the world. And these earthwork sites are, are currently under consideration for listing. Wow, that's wonderful. Uh, how long is the process for approval for something like that? Uh, it's a long road. Um, we've already been engaged in, in this work since 2008. We were put on what's called the tentative list, which is the sort of short list for sites that have uh, that are, have been recognized as potentially eligible, and uh, we would expect it would take uh, probably at least three years longer from today for that listing to take place. And uh, a lot of people are working together towards that goal right now. What, do you, what are some of the things that will come after that process is complete? What type of impact do you think that will have on the park? Uh, well. One thing, it will, it will bring uh, global recognition to these places that's really long overdue. There are many people who just aren't, f aren't aware uh, of the remarkable archaeological resources that we have here right in our own backyard here in southern Ohio. Uh, so it'll put us on a global stage. And that'll bring sort of heightened awareness of the sites, awareness of the contributions that American Indians made. Uh, to our lives today, and it'll also bring sort of heightened conservation uh, status for the sites, and, and of course there's uh, potential economic impacts in terms of increased tourism, and uh, you know we I think we would expect to see great increases in our visitation, and the more that communities come together to plan and promote. Uh, the opportunities that this will bring, you know, it could really be an, an explosion of tourism. That sounds extremely exciting. Yes. So if we look back a little bit, again, we know that those, those earthworks were there, and they were there for a long, long time and culturally significant. What happened between then and now? And so what's the reason for all the conservation work that you've done and all of the restoration that's been done? Why did, what happened? Well, um, so the earthworks, most of them have been uh, under agriculture for almost 200 years. So it, um, almost all of them have been greatly damaged by plowing to the point where walls that were once 12 foot tall are in, su are in some cases you know, barely perceptible to the eye. Uh, and so that's one of the, the challenges that we're trying to overcome with vegetation management. And, uh, So that's a constant thing that you'll be working on is how to manage the vegetation on those areas because some of those earthworks are extremely large as you mentioned right so that comes with a whole new set of challenges like managing brush or if you're going to mow that area right if it'll be a wildlife area how do you manage it so that the earthworks are actually visible Yes, and you know our our park has grown. It, it was established in 1923 as just uh, maybe about 40 acres, and since 1980 we've expanded to include uh, six earthwork sites and almost uh, or more than 1,800 acres, and just the just the scale of the management uh, is a challenge in itself. And um, some of the things we've learned is that. Some kinds of vegetation don't mix well with mounds and earthworks and archaeological sites. Woody vegetation in particular, uh, woody plants, the, the root systems can mechanically move artifacts around in the soil. And of course, when a tree dies and falls, that can be a catastrophic loss of archaeological resource. So um, 
so that's a challenge. We, we want to keep woody vegetation out. By the same token, our park, all the National Park Service, has a mission to promote biodiversity and wildlife. And over the past, well, in 2016, we finally came out with a long-term management plan. It's called a cultural landscape report. And the basic, uh, this plan is meant to sort of balance these concerns. And the basic intent of that plan, I think we have some maps that show maybe the uh, future vision. Um, the, yeah, this is a map that shows one of our earthwork units called the Hopeton Earthworks. And the basic goal of our plan is to plant the earthwork area proper in a turf grass that can be mown low. And that highlights the visibility of the earthworks. And also we can allow the grasses to grow taller on the earthwork walls themselves. And that uh, really highlights the visibility of the earthworks. But then all of that sort of buffer space surrounding the earthworks, we intend to plant in native grasses. And that's where um, we, in those areas, we can really promote uh, grassland nesting birds and pollinators and, and sort of balance our natural and cultural resource conservation efforts. And uh, I think we have an aerial photo that just was recently taken of this is our Hopeton Earthworks unit. This is the results of the first year of our uh, effort here where you can see we've planted turf grass over the earthworks and allowed it to grow tall on the earthwork walls. And really for the first time in, uh, in many, many years, those earthworks are really evident on the ground and visitors to the site can really experience the earthwork in something close, closer to its original majesty. But those outer areas is really where Jason's work with natural resource conservation comes in, and uh, so maybe Do you, you can, tell us something yeah. about that, Jason. So outside the earthworks themselves, these sites are still very important uh, archaeologically. So uh, we want to maximize the biodiversity uh, outside the earthworks, but also prevent any woody uh, encroachment from trees and or. Um, shrubs or things like that. So we want to keep these areas in, uh, in grasses and uh, wildflowers, um, but not let, let trees grow up. So our, our uh, compromise was to put them in native warm season forages and native grasses and forbs. So this is a picture here of what one of the sites looks like outside the earthworks. Um, this is a picture in the, taken in the fall. So we're surveying the grassland, seeing what species are present and what species aren't and how we can improve them. Excellent. I mean, this is a huge undertaking, isn't it? The, the area that you have to manage and the manpower that you have to work with are not equal. <laughs> right. We have hundreds and hundreds of acres that we're trying to put into this, these native grasslands and um, a limited number of staff to try to to try to uh, manage them. What are some of the, the, the plans you have to try to compensate for that, the lack of labor and the magnitude of work that needs done? Right, so what we've been doing, we have um, large tractors that we've been mowing these native grasslands with, um, but unfortunately that builds up a mulch layer on the, on the earth and uh, the native grasses aren't able to regenerate themselves very well with the, this thatch layer that's built up from mowing. Right. One thing I wanted to mention was that, you know, traditionally in a grassland situation like that, a fire would often be employed to help manage those grasses. Mm -hmm. But from previous conversation, we've discussed that that's not an option at the park. Right, right. We have concerns of what fire might do to archaeological resources, it might interfere with radiocarbon, radiocarbon dating and, and other things. We'd like to avoid that. And mm -hmm. so one option we've looked into is perhaps uh, taking these warm season grasses as hay. Mm -hmm. Which is something that we're going to talk about a lot with our next guest that we have on the program. Um, so thank you so much for coming and doing this program with us today, guys. It's been wonderful. We again want to invite everyone to come out to the park on Saturday, June 16th. 
This program will begin at 9 o'clock with registration in some park history. We'll then break into segments to cover the different topics. And uh, after we conclude at noon, there'll be a break for lunch and then an optional tour of the Hopeton site. So we hope everyone comes out. It's free, open to the public. And if you need more information about this event, you can contact me at the Noble County Extension Office. Our number there is 740-732-5681. So thank you. We have a second guest here with us who works at the Ohio State University South Centers branch in Piketon. Our second guest is Yogi Raut. Yogi, please tell us about some of the research that you've done at South Centers in relation to native warm season grasses. Uh, thank you for uh, this short and brief introduction. Actually, uh, we started this experiment for warm season grasses, uh, which experiment itself uh, was initiated by earlier uh, faculty uh, in 1999. So this research at South Centers has been going for a long time, for decades actually. Yeah. Yeah, this was a very um, long-term experiment. Uh, then as you can think of, that a CRP land and CRP program itself is a very long-term uh, federal initiative. Federal, what does CRP stand for? Uh, it's a conservation reserve program, okay. uh, which is a uh, um, public-private partnerships. And they are established uh, by the federal government uh, to incentivize the farmers who has land uh, so long uh, dedicated to row crops and once in a time that your land is getting very exhausted and maybe because of the terrain also, so you have to physically retire your land from the production and put into the system CRP or conservation reserve program. Uh, that is initiated by the government, our federal government. And that is something, uh, the contractual agreement is like uh, 10 years, one term, but then you will be paid based on your five years or past experience what you are getting. And there are certain incentives built on. And you pay it just because you don't farm your land. Okay, so that's it. It's designated in conservation. That is its sole purpose for that set amount of time. Yeah. That so that's where the research plots um, were originally started as part of research for those CRP programs? Yeah, this is something uh, by definition or by policy, you cannot harvest uh, any biomass or any kind of uh, uh, plant material from CRP land. So our uh, former uh, faculty member the, here in South, uh, at South Center and from Ohio State University, they plan to uh, uh, establish this experiment so that they can see. Uh, they cannot go for CRP land, but they can still uh, invest or they can still go through all the process that CRP land has. So it's physically, it's one difference is only that you are not under contractual agreement, but the rest of the factor, rest of the condition are exactly the same that you have in CRP. Okay, so then how does that build into the research that you've done fairly recently? So what happened in 2009, they put 10 different spaces into the uh, system. Uh, which was mostly um, big blue steam, uh, 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 switch grass, Indian grass, uh, eastern gamma grass, those species, and also uh, flower, native flower mix, okay. like wild flower mix. So altogether, I have seen they planted 10 different species, and they manage and maintain that land without harvesting for 10 years. When we saw that uh, uh, there was a uh, quest going on in the White House uh, sometimes, and they were um, asking questions that, okay, we have developed so much. We have like 35 million acre 
by then, right now it's less. Mm -hmm. But by then it was 35 million acre of CRP land, but nobody knows that how to manage this much big resources. So they were putting a question that, okay, how do we and what we know whether we are making big effort, enough effort to manage these resources. And that was, um, objective was like you have to uh, build the quality of, like a water quality, soil quality, carbon sequestration, and then also you are trying to create a habitat for um, wildlife okay. and mostly birds. Mm -hmm. So whether we met that objective by the time we also manage the resources, so there was a information gap that I could see that they didn't have enough information to justify whether we are met, meeting that requirement and we are getting everything what we expected. So that's the time we switched to this experiment that after 10 years, we didn't harvest anything. After 10 years, when we start harvesting, what will happen? Okay. So we laid out the experiment which had three different management system that you can harvest. One time harvesting was you can harvest everything as it grows. So mm -hmm. it was kind of green harvesting. Okay, then the so kind of be like a typical heat yeah, system? Yeah, yeah, that's it. The second, second uh, strategy was you can harvest one time during uh, spring season, and then you can um, harvest one time during winter season when they are dry. Okay. The third harvesting system was only when you can harvest in the dry condition, which is winter, mm -hmm. like a, a February or March somewhere. Do we have some photos that show uh, what this research looks like in the field? I think we have uh, that photo. Is, this is uh, the experimental design that we had. But if you can look into uh, the other one, then you, we have some other uh, mm, mm, harvesting also. So So what time of year is this photo? It's, it's a 2014. 2014, yeah. and it looks like this is maybe midsummer. Are we getting? Yeah, yeah. This okay. is almost uh, mid or at the end of summer. Okay. We can see that there's some seed heads developing yeah. on those stands. They're fairly mature, uh, but they also aren't senescent. Senescence, yeah, they, say they, are, they are getting senescence, yeah, in that stage. But then we had five different level of nitrogen application. So if we see that, okay, three harvesting system and five different level of nitrogen, so you can say 15 different treatment combinations. Wow, 15 uh, treatment. Tri different combination. Then we wanted to compare with the control, which doesn't have anything. Okay. So finally what we saw, uh, when you don't harvest for 10 years, we assessed the land cover was gone down to 40%, which means you, you virtually have no coverage. Is the, the population was so sparse. So when we started harvesting, it was gradually increasing. So harvesting more frequently was actually increasing the stand density? Yeah, but the, there are three different strategies that I explained just mm -hmm. now. So they have different, but it was overall across the harvesting as you harvest after first year, second year, and third year. So it went down, we went increasing from 40% to 100% again after three years time frame. So we really only needed three years. To get into the plateau. To plateau. Yeah. Rather than what had previously been thought of as like a very sparse, and we uh, uh, assess, we made big assessment to um, monitor the land cover percentage, and it was only 40% overall. Wow. So you can see a lot of gaps, and that gaps causes, like you don't have the same carbon stock that you are expecting, and you don't have the same uh, carbon sequestration that you are expecting, and then you have like a lot of other a nutrient uh, system that you cannot see that is working properly. So that was our finding that, so our finding was finally that uh, after five to seven years, depend on, depending on what kind of land and what kind of nutrition status in the soil, as what kind of soil health you have, mm -hmm. depending on those factor, five to seven years, if you don't harvest after that, then you start losing. Okay. So the take home message from that experiment we have is either use it or lose it. 
use it or lose it. Yeah, for both the purpose, like for even uh, even wildlife, everything. Because if you don't have a, sp a stand where they can hide or where they can use those kind of things, so that's the final message from that experiment. Okay, Yogi. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, uh, you have a wealth of information to share, and folks will have another opportunity yep. to interact with yeah, you. Sure. Uh, we together will be at the Hopo Culture National Historical Park for that Discover Native Warm Season Grasses program. Mm -hmm. Yogi and I will specifically be talking in the section that's more related to livestock versus wildlife or versus the park. Uh, some of the things we're going to talk about in our section are managing native warm seasons for hay, We'll also look at managing for grazing livestock. And one of the things that's really great is when we manage those native warm seasons for grazing cattle, sheep, goats, uh, even horses can graze many of those seasonal grasses. Um, it's also beneficial for wildlife. Ideally, we would want to manage in a grazing system to promote the ecosystem for wildlife, um, but strategically managing in a hay system can be beneficial, but in the long term, what's best is a grazing system or a longer term system, as Yogi discussed in that you know, about five year range. So we hope that you'll join us at that event coming up. Again, that's Saturday, June 16th, 2018 at Hopewell Culture National Historical Park in Chillicothe. Yep. Thank you so Thank much for joining us. Thank you.